All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the October. I can't believe it's October already, but uh, the October uh, District 3 community meeting. Uh, thanks for showing up on your Saturday morning. Um, so today our topic uh, is uh, going to be the new Alcove uh, Youth Mental Health uh, Services that will be uh, happening at the Beach City Health District campus on Prospect. Um, I think it uh, it goes live in November, but what I've done is I've invited um, Ali Stewart here from uh, Beach City Health District to uh, just be able to uh, talk about it and let us know what's going on. This is clearly a service for uh, all three beach cities and, and I think maybe even uh, outside of the beach cities um and and in my opinion uh sorely needed uh for our youth uh if we get through this topic uh you know and we still have time then we'll just uh do an open forum where we can just talk about whatever's on people's minds so uh with that said uh i'm going to introduce ali and uh ali if you need uh like to screen share or anything let me know and i can make you a co-host okay all right so take it away ali Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. As Christian said, uh, thanks for joining us on Saturday morning. I have John here with me. He's a member of our All Cove uh, Youth Advisory Group. And so we'll both be sharing some information about All Cove in the Beach City. So uh, Christian, if it is okay, I would like to share screen. I have some slides uh, that I'll just give you an overview of what we're planning to do. Uh, as the council member said, we are opening our doors on November 1st for services, and so we'll share what some of those are, uh, and then some upcoming plans for more community outreach and celebrating uh, in the months to come. All right, so I'm going to share screen. If I could get a thumbs up, uh, if you can see the slides on the screen, I'll go ahead. Thank you very much. Okay. Yep. Okay, great. So just to give a little background on all code. Uh, so this is actually based on an international model. A team from Stanford has been working on this for about 10 years to look at how could we really rethink how we deliver mental health services for young people in the United States. And so they looked around the world and found some uh, really promising practices from Australia, from Canada, um, from other countries that are really uh, able to offer this early intervention and prevention services for mental health for young people. Uh, and some of the key elements that we'll share with you this morning that make this a little different than maybe some of the other uh, services that are at schools or in other community settings, it's, it's really youth led. So I'll turn it over to John in, uh, in a few slides to, so he can share his experience of being uh, kind of a leader on our youth advisory group and uh, how they've been able to contribute to bringing all uh, to the beach cities. So uh, as the council member said, we will have the opportunity to serve young people uh, ages 12 to 25 in the South Bay. And I think what makes this unique too is that age range. I think typically uh, you have school-based services that are addressing mental health in a school setting uh, or those that are for what they call transitional age youth. And those are uh, young people ages uh, 18 to 25. But really when you look at the data, uh, this is a critical uh, period to really address uh, early intervention when it comes to mental health. And so uh, by opening it to this age range, we really think uh, it's an opportunity to address some of these concerns early on so they can have better outcomes, not only for their health and well-being, but also for some of the system costs that we see across the mental health continuum. So uh, right here in Redondo Beach, uh, right here in the, in the heart of District 3, so we're excited to bring this uh, to the beach cities. This was a competitive process. We applied for a state grant um, from the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission, and that's the big mental health fund across the entire state of California uh, that focuses on all uh, age ranges. And so uh, through this opportunity, again, serving uh, the beach cities, we had the opportunity to host uh, members of our Youth Advisory Council, and that's BCHD's uh, Council of Young People. So we had 50 uh, young people from the beach cities in the space on Tuesday night, uh, really getting a preview of what the space uh, will be moving forward. So again, uh, on the fourth floor uh, on Prospect Avenue, uh, right here in Redondo Beach. So when we look at that continuum, and this is some of the data that uh, I had mentioned, we do really do have this opportunity with young people uh, to intervene early when it comes to mental health concerns. And so again, that age range of 12 to 25 is really, really critical when we see that 50% of all uh, lifetime concerns around mental health uh, have started by the age of 14 and then uh, almost three quarters by the age of 24. And I think this barrier uh, to care that we'll talk a little bit more about um, is really uh, part of the, the, the 
model of the physical design of the space. What can we do to make services accessible, uh, anonymous, uh, in a space that feels like it belongs to a young person? So when they go in for the first time, uh, they get what they need uh, and they're able to feel comfortable uh, within the space. So when we look at the continuum of mental health care for young people, really, uh, we have really great programs in, in the South Bay and Redondo Beach. Our Redondo Beach Unified School District is doing great work to address social emotional health for young people. They have a lot of programs that we partner with them on that they bring in uh, from other community partners. So really, this is uh, intended to be a continuum. So uh, not uh, replacing any of the great work, working collaboratively with our school districts to make sure uh, that all code fits into kind of that community support. So when school is out of session, whether that's on a Saturday morning, uh, like we'll be open uh, starting in November or in the summertime, uh, when those services that might be offered in the school setting uh, are not available, that we would be able to have uh, all co open and a young person could continue to get that care. So uh, when we look at the continuum and really on the other end is uh, early psychosis programs, that's another priority of this state funding is to make sure we're addressing uh, mental health concerns across the entire continuum. So when we look at what will be offered uh, within Alcove, it really is in this prevention and early intervention space, uh, making sure we're doing lots of screening, uh, education, skill building, uh, and this is all youth-led and design, and John can share uh, that in a couple slides about what they've been able to contribute in uh, interviewing service providers and helping to decide the types of services that are offered. And then when we look at this more intensive uh, intervention side of the continuum, uh, making sure that we're linking to those services. So if a psychiatric bed is needed, Needed. That's not going to be offered at Alco, but we, we would be able to provide the information and referral uh, to be able to offer that, um, that referral and that connection through the space. So what makes Alco unique? Uh, John, if I could, uh, I'd love to turn this over to you so you can share just a little bit about from your perspective as a member of the Youth Advisory Group, what you think uh, makes Alco unique uh, in the, your voice. Can you hear me? Yep. All right, sweet. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Um, so I was a part of the youth advisory group and uh, or still am, but we uh, kind of what Ali is talking about, I think what makes all Cove unique is the decision making behind what that space looks like on prospect on the fourth floor and everything inside of there from the services to the colors on the wall to the snacks offered in the kitchen um, throughout the last six or seven months we've collectively as a group uh, made the decisions that um, have kind of put that building or that space together. Um, so we talk about uh, what what we think would be most needed um, when, when it comes to mental health and, uh, you know, the providers. We were even sitting in on interviews with 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 providers from from therapists to 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 you name it and then we collectively got together and said I, I feel like someone our age could feel comfortable working with this type of person and get something um that would benefit them long term um so our, our goal is not to just wear, raise awareness around mental health um but almost like change the narrative of it's like this is a space it's okay to deal with those types of things this is more normal than you think you're and and uh you know, build community and and uh, on Tuesday uh, we had the the ribbon cutting and it was a really special day for all of us because of all the hard work that that got put in. But we also were able to realize like, wow, this is really coming together and um, the support was 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 tremendous and um, so you know it, it was a great opportunity for me to to keep growing as a person and and. It's given me purpose, and it's it's really cool to see that 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 all Cove is is going to be able to provide this for the people um, within the age ranges of twelve to twenty five. So, those are my initial thoughts. Uh, yeah. Thanks, John. Yeah, John has been uh, quite busy. He's been active in a lot of the things that he described and on Tuesday yeah. had a chance to interact uh, with uh, the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission, as well as the technical assistance team from Stanford. They were down uh, visiting the space. So as we look at the service streams, and John talked about this a little bit, uh, these are the six core service streams that will be offered at Alcove. Uh, and this is really designed uh, 
uh, by the team from Stanford in collaboration with the state of what what is a young person in this age range, what might they walk in the door uh, seeking? And so uh, they might come in for the first time and not access any of these core service streams, maybe just utilize the, safe, the space as a safe place to come after school, uh, if they're uh, out of school uh, in between a job that they could uh, eventually know that these services are available. And we'll give you a preview of what the physical space looks like uh, in just a moment. So another key component is this peer support piece. So in addition to John and his colleagues on the youth advisory group, uh, we do have peer specialists. So as a young person walks into the door for the first time, they won't be greeted necessarily by an adult cl clinician. It will be a young person closer to their age that can explain the services that are available uh, and what they might uh, be able to access here within Alco. So I'll go through these clinical services really quickly. Uh, this will all be available on our, our website as well. And I, I know um, uh, Councilman is planning to share this too. So these are some of the types of services that a young person could come in, uh, traditional therapy, group and individual, um, other screening. Um, and for families too, we know that uh, uh, it's important um, as appropriate and as helpful um, to engage the family in the care um, if, if the, um, the clinician deems that to be a good fit. And so uh, those types of services will also be offered within the space, but it truly is a space for young people. So we're we're talking about that now if there are parent sessions or group sessions happening making sure uh, we kind of preserve that uh, youth driven space uh, so considering where those meetings might take place uh, not necessarily within the all code center but perhaps elsewhere uh, in the beach cities building so these are some of the physical health services uh, that can be offered and you'll see our list of providers uh, that we're bringing on board uh, who will be offering some of these physical health services. I think one uh, thing to clarify, it's not necessarily intended to be their medical home for a young person. Uh, it would be if they came in and perhaps they said, you know, I. I get a headache every time I have to take a test because I'm really anxious or I have some other co-occurring thing happening uh, that it might be helpful for a doctor to check out or a nurse to, to screen for. So to have that available uh, right there on site on the same floor that uh, you can really address um, any concern that a young person might be presenting as they walk into the space. Uh, these are some of the substance use services, and I know the topic of uh, fentanyl has been one that's been uh, brought up a lot in our community and across the country really of late. And so looking at how we not only build capacity for young people, but the community at large with some of the prevention services. So making training available, working with other partners in the county and others, uh, our local uh, law enforcement, if they're doing outreach around naloxone or uh, Narcan availability to make sure we're providing that um, type of uh, programming within the space. And this really supports that Beach City is kind of our overall strategy to address substance use in the youth population. Uh, we know that um, based on California Healthy Kids Survey data that um, in some uh, key substance areas that uh, young people in the Beach Cities um, uh, do um, use substances at a greater rate than their peers across the county and across the state. So uh, this too will continue the work happening in the school setting to really uh, address substance use. And I will say since uh, 2017, when we first formed our Beach Cities Partnership for Youth Coalition that the city of Redondo was really supportive of from the beginning, uh, we have seen some promising um, uh, improvements in substance use uh, in the beach city. So uh, we hope this continues uh, to build on that as we continue to look at uh, substance use of alcohol, uh, cannabis, uh, and other substances uh, being used by young people. So peer support, I mentioned this, kind of that peer-to-peer -peer opportunity, um, even in volunteer opportunities upcoming that uh, young people in the in the beach cities would be able to come over and uh, volunteer potentially in this space, also seek support from peers. Uh, I think uh, in selecting the location to be on Prospect Avenue, uh, we had some students from Redondo Union walk over. It's really accessible, uh, especially for Redondo Union, Patricia Deisler School, as well as uh, Paris Middle School, uh, and also working on active of transportation and make sure for those uh, that are coming uh, from other locations would be able to get there and access services as well. Uh, so family support, I mentioned, and we're enlisting uh, some of our partners that we've worked with for a while. South Bay Families Connected is one of those to provide uh, more family support as it relates to uh, support groups. And uh, Beach Cities Health District for about four or five years has actually partnered with South Bay Families Connected and Thelma McMillan's uh, 
uh, center to offer a parent chat. So that happens uh, on a weekly basis. It's a virtual opportunities for parents to drop in and get peer support. So things like that will continue and some, uh, as I mentioned, uh, might be offered in person uh, within uh, the, the existing 514 building. So supported education and employment, this is really uh, something else that makes all code unique. So not only the clinical components, but the supported education and employment. And that might be for a, a current high school student that's struggling uh, with a 504 and IEP uh, that they need to get back on track, that they would be able to come in, meet with our supported education and employment supervisor to really see uh, if there are things going on that they might be able to get support with in both mental health and some of their academic uh, pursuits, as well as in that critical uh, launch period after uh, high school as a young person is navigating what's next for them. As John said, finding purpose, finding out what really is the best fit for them to do uh, moving forward. And so uh, some of the skill building and uh, readiness uh, as they uh, navigate that, that launch period uh, after school. So uh, these are some of the things uh, that, although not core services, will be offered in Alcove as well, uh, more wellness services, and again, we'll rely on partners. And uh, John, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about just some of the partners or other things that we talk through uh, that might be a good fit. I know the Youth Advisory Group has brainstormed ideas on uh, some of this more fun uh, offerings that could be offered within uh, Alcove. Yeah, sure. Um, so we... we... Our, our mindset was more like if we're going to offer such a wide range of, of services, what what are some things that might be appealing to to um, people our age? Um, and on the slider, just uh, a few things we came up with. Uh, I understand uh, uh, artwork is going to be uh, a, like artwork meditation. There's going to be a service provided uh, at, at the facility. Uh, and we're just we continue in each meeting to and will continue um through us seeing how the 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 foot traffic and and what what is needed at the at the center um of of ideas of, of different services to offer so um art was on there yoga the 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 mindfulness um physical activity was was a big thing that we uh we kind of centered on and and what we could do to to offer like a physical health benefit long-term success sort of uh uh image that that people struggle with um because it's super important whether it's eating or working out and um so th those are just a few things i think it's it was unique for me to 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 hear from them um especially what what high schoolers might 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 appeal to them because i'm well out of high school now but anyways these are just a few things we came up with on the slide the the, the idea was how can we turn something fun into something that might benefit them mentally long long term so yeah thank you all right, so these are some of the service providers that we'll be contracting with to offer uh, some of these service streams within Alcove. You can see a lot of these are uh, longstanding partners of our school districts uh, in the community. Uh, UCLA Health is also located on that campus of so physicians and uh, nurses from uh, the existing UCLA office will be able to offer uh, some of the physical health and mental health services. Uh, South Bay Children's Health Center is a mental health uh, group that's worked with our school districts for a long time to offer counseling. Uh, in the school setting. And then, uh, as John was mentioning, some maybe more non-traditional partners in clinical spaces, Indivisible Arts. They're based out of Hermosa Beach. They do social emotional wellness programs and also a lot of art, music, and culture, uh, creative life mapping, uh, which is in that supported education and employment track. So, uh, and then uh, bringing back some bereavement support. Uh, that's an area too uh, that we've heard um, is something that's needed in the community uh, for young people as they're navigating um, loss and grief. And we know, especially through the pandemic, uh, those uh, those issues were really exacerbated. So to, to have that available as needed uh, within all global 
kind of round out the service offerings that we're able uh, to bring to the space. So uh, here's John and his colleagues on the Youth Advisory Group. Uh, they are young people from the beach cities, uh, from the South Bay that are representing the voices of their peers. Uh, and these are some of the ways that they've been able to contribute. Uh, John, anything else that you would want to add in kind of uh, the involvement of the, the Youth Advisory uh, Group and some of the decision making? Um, no, I wouldn't say too much other than uh, back to when we were talking about what makes all code unique is it, it is true that that everything is made by by this group, the decisions are, are really driven behind us. And so I think that's what makes the model so different than than others. And and uh, I'll just add that. In, like I was saying, I, it's provided me an opportunity just to grow my community, and it, and I don't know. I think what we're doing is special, and all of the opportunities that have been given to us and will continue to be um, given to us through through the opening the doors of of, of the cove. It's 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 really exciting. So. Um, I certainly have, have really enjoyed my time being a part of the youth advisory group um, and to see it all kind of happening and happening the way we envisioned it is is special, like I said. So um, that's all I really have to share about it. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, John. All right, so this is was conceptual and then I'm going to show you some photos uh, of what this space actually looks like. So again, um, John and his colleagues were able to kind of decide furniture, colors, etc. to make it seem warm and welcoming and not like a typical clinic space or uh, doctor's office. Uh, so these are some of the photos of the chat rooms uh, and these are constantly rotating. So part of the unique nature of Alcove is that um, every time a young person meets with whether it's the a therapist, a career counselor, um, or even doing a small group session with with peers or uh, friends for a class project, they'll be able to ro rotate through this, this space. So it's not the stigma of that's the therapist room. So anybody who walks in that door is going to see the therapist. It's really rotating. Uh, and so uh, John and his colleagues were able to uh, name the rooms. You want to talk, John, about the how you decided on the naming and kind of some of the themes of the uh, of this chat. Sure. So. Well, there's, I believe, nine chat rooms and two meeting rooms, and the colors you see on the wall, like I said, we, we chose those, but then you'll see in the in the bottom corner uh, of those walls are a version of the, the Alcove logo, so we were also able to select the logos that we thought might be most appealing. I think I thought they all kind of looked cool, but uh, then the names of the rooms are all uh driven uh that we gave them a theme so it was more like a beach southern california um um sort of sort of theme so like names of the rooms would be the pier room the coral room uh wave like it, it was all centered around um um the kind of location in in southern california beach vibe so Thanks, John. And I think that uh, another thing uh, that I hadn't mentioned about Alco, uh, we are uh, the second location open in the state of California. So that's really exciting that right here in Redondo Beach, uh, we have only the second location of Alco. And really, the team uh, hopes that uh, eventually you'll be able to find Alco centers across the state of California. So if a young person is moving out of the area, maybe going to college or moving away, um, they would be able to recognize it through this consistent uh, look and feel and brand that. An all Cove Center uh, is a safe space for them to go and access these types of services. So uh, when we look at to Australia, they have about 140 of these locations across the entire country. And so uh, we are one of five new grantees across the state of California bringing all Cove Centers uh, in the first in Southern California. So, uh, John, I'm going to put you on the spot since I know you did this the other day. I, I have a rough video that's kind of a walkthrough of the uh, opening space, uh, the entrance and the cove. So uh, if I play it, if you're able to just kind of walk the, uh, uh, everyone sure. kind of what a young person would experience uh, for the first time, we'll see if my video will play here. Sure. So this is uh, this is the first thing you're going to see when you walk in. Uh, 
um, you're as if you're walking out of the elevator essentially. And then those iPads are one option to check in. Uh, we had that vision that if, if, if you don't want to have necessarily that as much interaction, um, there's, we, we gave, we provide two options to check in and be guided to, to a service that we're offering at the front desk and on that iPad. Uh, right after that, you saw a list of the providers. Here is our desk and um, kind of like cubicles for people to do schoolwork, uh, work on career um, endeavors, uh, resume building. And you'll see throughout the entire space, there's a lot of furniture, a lot, a lot of different seating and a lot of different places to hang out. Uh, right here is more seating underneath those tables are plugins for electronics as well as a space to hang your backpack and um, purses. Um, so now we're about to enter the cove. Um, and as you can see, there is some, there's good views. Um, but this space is kind of the main area. Uh, the idea is a place for young people to hang out. Um, but all these colors, the furniture was all run by the youth advisory group. And we helped drive the decision behind what, what you're literally seeing right now. Um, they're about to take us over to the kitchen. So everything you see there is, is, uh, were snacks that we thought would be healthy, but appealing. Um, so we, were, we even did a taste test during one meeting. There's a ping pong table and uh, those dividers at those tables give you an opportunity to uh, be private, get quiet space, but all while maybe being together with somebody, so. Thanks, Don. Yeah. yeah. The live voiceover. <laughs> All right. Uh, so just a few more slides here. So when we look at financial sustainability, I mentioned previously, uh, this opportunity was originally made possible through the state's Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission. So BCHD applied for and received a grant uh, one of five new grantees across the state of California. So uh, the initial $2 million of funding uh, will be for that four-year pilot period. We are actively working with partners across the state uh, with the commission, with Stanford to figure out sustainability. So I think in this pilot program, uh, two main goals are around both sustainability of how do we pay for these services long-term and how do we scale this up? So uh, how do we get more of these all code centers across the state of California? So uh, that in addition to offering these services to our community, we'll be actively working uh, to figure out the, those pieces and also talking about some of the public-private partnership opportunities uh, that could be offered through this space uh, with our healthcare system partners. Uh, there are requirements in the state of California around community benefit uh, and how they are funding community-based efforts. So how can we work alongside our healthcare partners to offer uh, these services along with other uh, funding opportunities? Uh, in the state of California, the, this fund is uh, um, more than three and a half billion dollars a year. It's on a millionaire's tax. Uh, so any uh, person in California earning uh, more than a million dollars is uh, taxed through the Mental Health Services uh, Oversight and Accountability Commission. So looking at how do we really transform uh, mental health services for young people uh, to decrease uh, the need uh, later in life for, for these uh, individuals. So. Uh, the other opportunity uh, through uh, the work uh, of our Congress member, uh, uh, Congress member Lou, uh, he was able to champion a million dollars of community project funding. Uh, so some of the transformation of the physical space was made possible uh, through that federal funding. So uh, looking at how we really blend and braid funding opportunities to make this service available uh, to the beach cities and beyond. So uh, just quickly touching on uh, the future, um, all code will be a core component of the future healthy living campus. Uh, there will be a, an on-the-street entrance for young people to be able to access all Cove in addition to all this open space. So uh, there will be physical uh, design similar to what you see in the temporary location of the chat rooms and the Cove and others, but we'll also be able to utilize kind of a larger campus to do some of the wellness type activities uh, that we had shared previously. 
Uh, so just in terms of the process, we're still moving uh, through. Uh, we have a board approved master plan. Uh, you can see some of the previous conceptual renderings of the campus. Uh, and today, uh, uh, these are some of the core elements uh, when we look ahead. So uh, the orange is the, the building over in the, uh, the top of uh, it, it will be where Alcove will be located um, uh, with the open space in the middle of about two acres of open space uh, right there. And uh, you can see some of the, the changes that we've made based on uh, the community side feedback that we've received over the past five years. So uh, we wanted to invite all of you and we'll get the word out about this even more. Um, our opening uh, date is November 1st to open the doors and offer uh, services to young people with those service streams. Uh, and then we're gonna do a big community celebration in January uh, on a Saturday. Uh, so we can invite um, all ages to come check out the space, know what's available right here on Redondo Beach. So uh, invite all of you uh, to come out and participate in that. Um, and I think uh, the other uh, opportunity too is really uh, to get the word out to young people. And so I think that's where John and the Youth Advisory Group, they have a lot of ideas on how the peer-to-peer -peer outreach uh, can be done to uh, make sure that young people know that this is available uh, to them. So we're just really excited to offer this uh, service to the beach cities. Uh, starting November 1st, we'll be open between 1 p.m. and 7 p.m., uh, Tuesday through Friday, and then on Saturdays from 10 to 2 for those who aren't able to uh, access the services during the weekday. So um, any uh, help you could give us in getting the word out, and we'll be working closely with our school and city partners to make sure uh, that we make the community aware that this is now available uh, in Redondo Beach. So. I will stop sharing there and I'll turn it back over uh, to Council Member Horvath uh, if there are any questions for either me or for John. Good. Well, I, I, let me start with some questions. And I think some of it was on the slides, but I, uh, I just want to make sure that it gets uh, reiterated, right? So it's a free service for uh, anywhere between, what did it say, 12 to 25 or? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, and and the the idea being that that'll be a sustainable free service, you know, into the future, but right now covered by the state grants that you got. Yes, correct. So that state grant funding is covering the uh, the contracts with the service providers to offer these services free of charge. Okay. And then and then the hours again, uh, just repeat those so that everybody is clear. <laughs> yeah. So to start for these first three months until that January 28th date, uh, one to seven to uh tuesday through friday and then on saturdays from 10 to 2. okay all right and then uh availability so right now the beach city health district services three communities uh mm -hmm. redondo hermosa manhattan uh is it only available to those three communities or is it available to students in torrance or you know other you know adjacent communities yeah, and I can uh, weigh in on that. So through the state grant funding, we do have the opportunity to make the services available to the greater South Bay. And this is something similar to what we were able to do through COVID when we established the South Bay Consortium for School Vaccines. So knowing that for some health issues, a more regional approach is more effective and more uh, cost efficient. So we were able to work with the school districts uh, in the greater South Bay in partnership with the County Department of Public Health to offer vaccines for first uh, school staff and then later uh, students. So we'll be able to do the same thing with all Cove. So young people from the South Bay can come to Redondo Beach to access these services. So uh, much like with the city, if you come into the city and enjoy city services uh, while you're spending time there, even if you're not a resident, it's the same thing for all Cove. They can physically come uh, to all Cove Beach cities on the fourth floor of Prospect uh, and access these services. But I think to start uh, of the 55 young people that we've had in the young uh, in the space since Tuesday, uh, 54 of the 55 were from the beach cities. And so we know the proximity is going to be a big driver of access to, and that's why uh, we're excited uh, to have it so close to, to our schools at the biggest high school uh, in Redondo, uh, just down the street, able uh, to walk to. So we're looking forward to working with our school partners to you know, essentially do field trips so young people know that the, the space is available and really close and accessible, uh, especially for our Redondo students. Great. And so let me let me try to uh, drill down a little bit. Right. So uh, and on, as to how it works. Right. Uh, if you know, you're a kid who is suffering from anxiety. Right. Um, it, it, is this a place where they could 
come and get evaluated, but then they would still need to go off through their own health insurance and see somebody on a regular basis? Or, or do you imagine that this place is something where they could come on a regular basis and meet with somebody? Like, how does that work? Because I think, you know, the current healthcare system sucks and people, uh, <laughs> you know, are always trying to figure out, you know, it takes months sometimes to be able to see a mental health service provider, right? Mm -hmm. So how, how does this work like in the, you know, in the confines of our existing system? Is it, you know, uh, additive? Is it meant to be standalone, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I can jump in and John, you weigh in on this too. So I think that's one of the big uh, barriers that we're trying to address. I know uh, that we are lucky in the beach cities to have uh, a lot of providers. I think whether or not they're in network with insurance can sometimes be challenging that they opt because of uh, the paperwork required to uh, go through uh, the insurance system that they just do private pay and that cost barrier can be really prohibitive, especially if you're looking at, you know, a weekly visit for $200 an hour, or if you're talking psychiatry, $700 an hour, that might be many months out to get an appointment. So uh, when a young person walks into the space, uh, they will immediately be connected with that service. So decreasing wait times is a huge um, priority of ours that they can get the support that they need right away uh, and not have these wait times. I think typically in our healthcare system, uh, you have to present your insurance card or how you're going to pay before you even get to have a conversation with a provider uh, on what you might need. And I think uh, with all COVID shifts that narrative a little bit, it's more of what do you need and how can we help instead of how can you pay and what's your uh, insurance status and so i think to flip that narrative and then when we look at duration of stay uh, the one location that is open in palo alto that's being supported by the team from stanford uh, they're seeing a duration of stay for some of these clinical services at around 45 days so if a longer um, service is needed, there would be the opportunity to potentially refer off-site so that continuous uh, care can be available. But I think uh, there is no uh, limit in terms of how long a young person could come and access the services within the all space. And maybe they access clinical services and then um, are there for a longer time accessing some of the wellness uh, components. But all that will be tracked uh, through a shared data set called Data Cove uh, that Stanford is developing for all code locations across the state of California. So we can really have uh, good access data of not only the types of services that are being utilized, what is the duration of stay, and are there things uh, that young people are presenting as they walk through the door uh, that are more intensive needs that would need to be referred off-site. So uh, I hope that answers your question that uh, if a young person does come in, uh, they're able to talk to someone right away. Uh, and um, uh, the cost component isn't a barrier. Uh, the duration of stay isn't a barrier. Um, and really, uh, the other unique thing offered um, through this integrated care model is that if they tell their story once, they don't have to keep repeating it, because that's what we find in these siloed healthcare systems that they go to the doctor's office and have to tell their story about their anxious thoughts and they go to the therapist and then they decide they need to see a psychiatrist. All those providers are going to be working together in a care care management case management model. So uh, they'll be working uh, alongside one another to make sure the health outcome is the best for the young person. And I think um, one other um, opportunity through this, even the non-clinical services are part of that conversation as appropriate. So uh, if the supported education and employment supervisor is working with a young person on their career goals, and it's beneficial for them to talk uh, with a therapist on how they might work together to support that young people, that young person, all that care is coordinated uh, within the space. Um, so John, anything you'd wanna add kind of on that um, access to care, care or, um, uh, any other barriers that we're hoping to address through all code? Um, I think you covered the, the the gist of it other than uh, when they are being offered. Uh, I felt like just, just even it, it might be hard to decide what what way to turn or, or what you might even need. Um, so that is what we are there for. Um, but also when we were doing that, that video that we just saw, you know, when you enter, there's there's a variety of options of how to check in and narrow down um, the provider that you'd be paired with. And then, you know, from there, uh, at least you're in the door with, with that person. Uh, and, but yeah, I don't have anything to comment on as far as insurance and stuff like that. 
So, so it seems like, you know, the, the idea too, aside from having uh, services uh, that are available and accessible uh, is that, you know, you're creating a safe space for, you know, youth that are having a variety of personal experiences or issues where they can then have a safe community to either sh share with or just be a part of, you know, where everybody's kind of going through similar stuff. Is that, is that the idea of creating the, the cove and all that, you know? Yeah, I, I think something I would comment off of that um, through lived experience is, especially when I was a teenager or, or younger, going in and, and, and seeing a face, um, because getting them through the door is going to be the hardest part. But, but one, I don't think I understood what I struggled with, let alone anything to do with mental health, health and how that might contribute to how I'm living daily. Um, but talking to somebody else that can relate that is similar in age is super powerful and, and, and it can go a long way. So it, even in, if it's the community might keep coming keep them coming back but also the options of 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 providers i think also like if if they click with somebody um that's just like the icing on the cake like so that's just kind of what I, what i thought when it's not just the community but it's just it's like expanding it's like everything into one if that makes sense sure yeah, it seems like, uh, you know, over the years, especially with social media and internet creep, right, everybody's become a little more insular, right? And then they're only relating through a screen or texting and and we're losing that broader sense of, you know, community, you know, uh, so uh, it sounds great. Um, okay, well, last question, and then I'll turn it out to, uh, to everybody else on the call. And I apologize for monopolizing the questions uh, early on, but... Um, so, you know, substance abuse, uh, which we've talked about, you know, with the health district, uh, of course, multiple times is an issue in the beach cities, uh, more so than most people realize. Um, eating disorders, is that something that kind of falls into the the broader, uh, you know, window of, of mental health or, or is that separate, you know? Yeah, and I can uh, weigh in on this. And I know, John, I think you were in on the interview. So one of our providers actually is going to offer uh, groups uh, for young people who might be um, experiencing a, a challenge with an eating disorder. And I think even in the mental health continuum, uh, that uh, you know was recently recognized as um, a mental health concern of priority. And I think what they found in, in uh, the Palo Alto location was that was something that was commonly presenting uh, in uh, in that clinical space that they needed more support and resources. So we're glad that we have a provider who will be offering that service. And again, she would be able to work collaboratively with the other clinicians within the space that if something came up in a group and it would be better addressed in a one-to-one uh, -one session, we'd be able to do that uh, on site. And I think, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think as we open the doors, if there are specific things uh, that we don't currently have a provider for or are offering in the space, I think we'll have the opportunity to continuously add additional services. Uh, we know uh, that there are others uh, within our community uh, that want to help and um, come to the space. And so in the future, probably in the spring, uh, John and his colleagues will have an opportunity to interview additional uh, service providers as we build out kind of our network, just depending on uh, what the needs are. So I think after November 1st, we'll have a better idea as we collect this data on uh, the greatest needs of our unique community uh, and then make sure we're at, um, uh, providing those uh, services within the space. Got it. And I think you mentioned uh, you're going to be doing outreach to the schools uh, and whatnot. So what is the plan for, you know, because John just made the comment that the hardest part right is getting people in right and uh so so what what are we what are we doing you know between you know the, the soft launch in november and then january to really build awareness aside from doing a, a community meeting like this yeah, and John, you weigh in too because i know we've talked a lot about this so i think that peer-to-peer -peer component you know 
hey, if you're going over there and you know about the space to invite a friend, and it could be for something not clinical that they access for the first time. So maybe they're coming to do a meditation session or yoga or learn about some career development opportunity uh, and not even be aware of some of the other clinical places So uh, or pieces. I think that um, the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, opportunity for outreach, we will do some social media promotion. And then I think through our business community, as we look at the 18 to 25-year-old range, uh, we have a lot of young people who work in the community who might be needing these services. So working with our chambers of commerce in the South Bay uh, to get the word out uh, to this age group. And uh, John, I know uh, you all have brainstormed a lot on uh, the best outreach strategies. So anything else you could, oh, and the events. Maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the events too. Uh, right. Uh, I mean, we there's sure events have been held um, that, that just continue to get the word out. Uh, I think the biggest thing will, will be that uh, sort of word of mouth approach um, when it comes to uh, different communities, whether it's in the high school or, you know, personally, why, why I even live in, in this area was, was to, I entered recovery a few years ago and LA is a great spot to be young and working to, to you know i'm sober essentially so uh, I, I i that's why i moved down here and um i'm very involved in aa and and that's just like a minuscule group of people that would benefit from this completely um and also she does mention people at the workplace or even family and then that i also um, when we met all the providers on on tuesday um they just were so eager to want to help bring people to the space. And they're like, I know we, I can. So it's like almost like a, a team effort to, for the outreach and to get the word out. But then also as the, the youth advisory group, we've brainstormed ideas through social media, which, which is a huge attraction to people in their, in, in high school and teens. And, um, but from us starting as, as, as the youth advisory group, growing to the providers, growing to people beyond. Um, I think I think that's how we approach getting, getting people to hear about the space. Got it. Ali or, and John, are, will you also be uh, like, um, will different healthcare organizations, you know, uh, Torrance Memorial, Little Company, you know, uh, UCLA, as you mentioned earlier, are they also aware to kind of, you know, their, their clinicians and or, you know, physicians, uh to tell people about the services as well you know uh it, it, from an ad you know thinking about it in an additive perspective from what they offer already yeah and that's a great suggestion and i think uh on our website on bchd.org backslash all beach cities there's a place where any partner agency can request a pr promotional packet little postcards with hours location services offered uh, and we'll be doing some of that outreach over the next couple months in anticipation of january and our larger opening to make sure if you're sitting in the waiting room of one of those offices or meeting with your uh, physician that they'd be able to hand hand you a postcard with information about all clothes so uh, we're receptive to any of those ideas. We'd love to get that down at City Hall too, and other locations, the library, other places that young people might be gathering uh, to really uh, just let the community know this resource is available. But I'm going to make a note of that uh, to make sure we do that direct outreach to our healthcare partners, so uh, they're uh, aware of this service. Uh, so. Great. All right. Let me. Uh, let's. If anybody has questions, uh, comments. Uh, you can uh, raise your hand, uh, just click on the more button at the bottom of the uh, Zoom screen, and then uh, I think it should be there, or have they moved it now? Zoom keeps changing. Uh, anyways, uh, or you can just turn your video on uh, if your video is off and raise your hand physically, and I will call on you. Uh, uh, under the reaction buttons. Thanks, Lee. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't keep up. Uh, all right. Any questions, comments? All right. Oh, oh that's a that's a clapping hands. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Well. Uh, oh wait, there we go. Okay, Nanette, go ahead. You just have to unmute. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, I. 
I am thrilled that this is finally happening. Um, it's something that I, I think every community needs, so I'm very excited about it. Um, what sort of role do can other community members do, be involved? To what level can they be involved? It's a good question because the Beach City Health District is so adverse to volunteers. <laughs> that being sarcastic. Yeah. Go ahead, Allie. <laughs> yeah, and I think you know that's a great question. So. Uh, our campus greeters were on hiatus for uh, a period of time during COVID, and uh, we're excited to bring uh, that group of volunteers back. And so, uh, those are that's an opportunity for adults uh, who are maybe outside of that 12 to 25 year old age range to interact with young people coming into the space. So, uh, they would volunteer at the front desk and talk about services, perhaps escort them up to the fourth floor so they know uh, how, how to navigate to get there. Uh, we have lots of volunteer opportunities. Um, I think with some of the parent uh, components, we're looking at how do we engage um, adults in the process of volunteering to support the All Cove Center. And so uh, lots of ideas on how we might be able to do that. Uh, and then I think just getting the word out. If you uh, have long, young people in your life or interact uh, uh, with that kind of age range to let others in the community know that this is available. Uh, and if they want to volunteer uh, with Beach Cities, we have a, a job for everyone. So whether you want to work uh, in a school garden or help uh, uh, navigate someone uh, to get to to find the Alcove uh, Center on the fourth floor. Uh, we'd love to have uh, the community support. So thanks okay. for asking that question. Yep. Good. Anyone else? All right, Ali and John, I'm not seeing any other questions. So thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday to uh, to be with us here and share this. Uh, would you, before you leave, just reiterate the uh, the the openings and the times, uh, just so we had it uh, repeated here as many times as possible? Yeah, John, you want to take that? Have I said that enough times? <laughs> uh, times Tuesday to Friday from one o'clock to seven. seven and then <laughs> saturday from 10 to 2. um i know the community uh, grand opening will be january 2028 and then um, we are starting to offer those services on uh, november 1st to young people fantastic great well, thanks again, both of you, for being here. Uh, for the rest of you, we can uh, stay on and uh, do another 40 minutes of just uh, open forum questions. So, Ali, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, John, and we'll see you all soon. And I'll uh, pop by as soon as I can. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks, right. guys. Appreciate you. Take care. All right. So we can move into uh, anything else that anybody wants to talk about at this point. Uh, again, just uh, raise your hand or uh, or put a question in the uh, chat section and uh, we'll take it from there. Anyone? All right, you're all so quiet today. Well, uh, then if there aren't any other questions, uh, I will just uh, comment on uh, the special election uh, that happened this past week. Uh, it looks like the measure uh, has a good chance of being defeated. Final votes won't be counted until next Thursday. Uh, but uh, that's good news, which means that, uh, as we've talked about in previous uh, meetings, uh, the city's own ordinance, which uh, has been worked on for multiple years, will stand. Um, with that said, there will probably in March, uh, remember we have March elections here for local office, uh, there will probably be a ballot measure uh, specific to a more formalized tax system for the two cannabis locations that would be allowed in the city and or delivery entities. Um, and in that scenario, I just want to point out, uh, it, it's my understanding that that tax is not necessarily passed along to the consumer, it's actually on the business itself. Uh, so I know sometimes people don't like to be taxed every which way, but the idea being here that it would be uh, specific to the retail locations. Um, 
Ron, go ahead. So is there any indication of what where the two locations are? Because I have a feeling it's going to end up both being on Artesia Boulevard. So the way the ordinance is written is that you can only have uh, one location per district, but a maximum of two citywide. So technically, could you have two on Artesia Boulevard? Possibly, because I think there's some sections of Artesia that are District 5 and, and the majority of it is District 4. But I don't think that's the intent of, uh, of the ordinance and the way it was written. Um, and so uh, even in my, you know, informal survey monkey polls uh, last year, uh, people would prefer to see one in North Redondo and one in South Redondo. Um, and so we will have to wait and see, but you can always review the, um, uh, not only the ordinance, but all the work that was done and see that there was a lot of care taken into um, uh, radiuses around schools. Um, and uh, and a variety of other factors uh, that were put into the process to determine where could things go. So it just can't go anywhere. There are limitations, and uh, we will just have to wait and see, based on the application process. You know, where uh, who who gets a license, and then where they decide to uh, set up shop. But I, I understand your your concerns. Ron, while you're, since you're on here, do you want to um, just provide any uh, updates um, on the work that you're doing as part of the Charter Review Committee? Because we haven't really talked a lot about that here, um, but, you know, it may be good just to kind of give an update as to what the group has uh, been discussing, what are, you know, some recommendations that may be coming forward, because I'm hearing that there may be recommendations coming forward for things to add to the March ballot as well. Um, yeah, so we have been having our regular meetings and I believe that they're writing up a report to present to the council for its November meeting. Um, and so I, I, I actually preferred not talking about it until the actual group as a whole ultimately decides that our next meeting is on Thursday. Um, one of the proposals that just got voted in, it's going to be in our minutes, so I don't mind sharing. So there's been a lot of discussion about having the city attorney being appointed as opposed to elected. And so that proposal is going to be making its way to the council. We're looking at some other structural things going on, uh, but for the most part, uh, the council will be getting something, I believe, their first meeting in November. Okay. All right. And uh, I think it's my understanding that uh, even if the council was to take a recommendation like that for the city attorney and put it to a vote of the people, that that's a vote that actually has to happen uh, at a uh, November general election. It can't happen during the March election. I there's believe it's supposed to be in the March for the March election because there's a, a deadline coming up for getting things on the ballot. So once no, no, it you're... gets... Yeah, you're correct on that. Yeah. Once but, it gets uh, to the council, it's still the council has to decide, you know, the charter review committee can make recommendations, but ultimately it's the council that drafts the resolution that puts it on to the actual ballot. So I assume that's going to be happening starting in the beginning of November. Correct. No, I, I just, uh, I recall that when the, you know, certain charter changes have to go on a general election, not a local election. Uh, it happened when the city treasurer took to the voters that they wanted, he wanted to lower the salary from what it was to the $25,000 uh, range that it's in now. Uh, and he had to wait until a November general election to be able to do that particular change. So Yeah, and this one, the only person that's actually, and that's why the city attorney gets mentioned, the only one that it actually would impact and starting in the March election would be the city attorney position, because right. the others are, are chartered, they're already serving their existing term. Got it. Okay. All right. Uh, so thank you for reporting out on that. And hopefully you can provide more insight uh, as to what's been going on uh, when you feel comfortable. Okay, and I can share with you what's going on with the parquet that's at the corner of 
um, Flagler and Ripley since it is in District 3. So the Public Arts Commission was asked to come up with some sort of park dedication um, plan and they drew up some wonderful plans um, that has now cleared public arts, has cleared historical, and I believe just cleared parks and recreation. So it should be presented to the council as well. And that is the Ito family space. Um, there's going to be, uh, the, they're using landscaping as the actual part of the actual um, presentation of, of, the par of the park in a way that kind of conveys the story as well. So there's going to be a little bit about the Ito family, and then there's going to be a little bit about the um, possibility of discussing the Japanese internment camps in there, whether it's signage and the symbolism in the park. Um, so we're hoping that it actually is a park that'll have some contemplative use to see what's going on in the community. It's right across the street from Jefferson. So we're hoping that that also creates an education opportunity for the kids to learn a little bit about more about what happened in our community in the 40s. Super exciting. And I want to thank you personally, Ron, because uh, you were a driving force behind the name change and uh, and basically everything that's happening there. So thank you very much for your service. Thank you. Um, okay, Diane has a question. What is happening with the $30,000 fire department county survey? Uh, so I think, Diane, what you're referring to is that when uh, Councilmember Obaji got elected on his first night in office, he made a uh, referral to staff to restart uh, the process of uh, doing a study for going to LA County Fire, which the council had previously um, uh, gone through a phase one study and then, uh, and then chose not to move forward with the phase two. Uh, that of course led to Mr. Obaji's uh, trying to recall his predecessor, Councilmember Graham. And uh, so here we are. Uh, so uh, what is happening with that right now? I'm not sure where it is in the process. I, I believe the request clearly was made to county. I think county is busy right now and uh, has not been able to uh, move forward with the phase one aspect of that uh, as of yet. Uh, but I will uh, I will check with staff and uh, and try to have a report out on that at the next uh, community meeting uh, and or email you uh, with with whatever I'm able to find out in the meantime. Okay. Uh, yes, Ron, go ahead. Uh, I did want to at least announce to the group that the Redondo Beach Historical Museum is open again. We're having sporadic hours, but if you check the social media site for the city, you will find out in advance of when we're open. We've had some successful programs on open houses recently. Um, and then anybody wants to volunteer to actually be a docent at the museum, um, we're open to that. We're trying to get a, a youth docent program as well to actually ties in with the theme of trying to create something that the students can use on their college applications that has some meaning to them. So um, again, if you want to volunteer, we're contact community services they have a whole process that you can fall into relatively quickly and it's a lot of fun we're meeting a lot of nice people coming through good and ron if you want to send me information i'll put it in the next uh you know e-blast for next month as well okay thank you um and and just so everybody knows the the museum that uh ron is referring to is over at dominguez park uh so that's on flagler uh, between 190th and barrel um and it's in the queen anne house which is the um the little yellow house okay uh bob uh what is the purpose of changing the election of the city attorney to appointing bob i don't know i'm i'm really not quite sure why some of my colleagues are um helping on on this and and their their appointees to the uh, charter commission um, Mr. Morocco might be able to provide us some more intimate details as to the discussions that they're having uh, at, in the Charter Committee itself. Um, but uh, some people really believe that uh, the city attorney should not be elected and should be appointed. Um, personally, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think it's, uh, it's good to have a, a duly elected city attorney. Um, especially in a town with the dynamics that Redondo seems to have. Uh, 
uh, he is accountable or she uh, would be is accountable to the residents, uh, no different than a council member is versus being at the whim of being hired or fired by a council. Um, so uh, I think uh, City Attorney Webb has done a good job. We also have a very unique, uh, you know, there's not many cities that have the dual uh, city attorney functions that we do. So the city attorney is not only a city attorney, uh, but also functions as the head of our prosecution department. We do prosecution for uh, misdemeanors here. Uh, not only in Redondo, we also are hired out to do it in Hermosa as well. Um, so, Ron, I don't know if you want to add any color to that because you've been uh, uh, way more intimately involved in these discussions. Yeah, I, I will tell you my position is should be elected. Um, but um, if you all the meetings are recorded, so the same way you would access any of the city council meetings, you can access the last charter committee meeting. We actually had a very robust discussion um, there um, about appointed versus elected, and you'll get a flavor for that. There is going to be a report that's going to be submitted to the council, and it will have, at this point, it's supposed to have a majority opinion and a dissent. So um, you'll get at least some of the arguments that are there and some of the charter committee materials that were on again on the city's website actually breaks down the last ballot proposal that happened uh, when it was an advisory vote. So you can even see the ballot arguments that are in favor or against it. Got it. And Ron, I think um, I, I tuned into one of those meetings where you were making comments. How many times has the has the populace voted on on this in in the in the past? Uh, five times. The last time was in 1999. Um, two of the people that are on the Charter Review Committee, I, I actually one of them wrote the ballot proposition um, argument. So it's kind of I've been looking at it's what's changed since 1999. But the last time it came up for a vote as an advisory vote, it ended up getting less than 30 percent of the ballots in favor of changing it. But it's and been in the charter since 1934, and before that, it was an appointed position. And I think you were saying that two of your charter committee members were on the council at that time, or? Um, I, I they, they were both councilmen um, at the time. I don't, I know that one of them was during the initial charter review back in the earlier 90s. Um, I think he was also at that point, but he signed the ballot proposal, so. Got it. Um, okay, so, you know, I don't know what's going on, folks, but clearly people have an agenda. So, uh, Bob, I hope that answers the question, uh, but to, to Ron's point, the Charter Review Committee meetings are accessible uh, via YouTube, so, uh, you know, you can always tune in and, and uh, look at the agendas and then tune into the meetings uh, to see discussions specific to that. Um, okay, uh, Diane, you got your hand up. Go ahead. I uh, attended Nils' online meeting, and he was talking about something that I wasn't clear about. Mentioned something about they want to cut off funding to the Artesia Boulevard um, uh, property owners because he thinks they're getting too much money and they need to start spending their own for fixing things up. I so do you know anything about this? Well, I'm I'm, I'm without having seen what he said, it'll be hard for me to comment. But oh, okay, we we had uh, we created a program uh, which has now been expanded, you know, citywide and is even going to be used down on the international boardwalk. But we created this program some years ago. To uh, it's kind of an incentive based program um, to do like uh, fix fix up to the facades of businesses on Artesia, right, and aviation. Um, and it, it was a, a three-tier program, uh, so where the city would, uh, would give X amount of money based on the amount of money that the property owner and or lessee uh, was willing to put in. And so, they're, they're like, the small tier, I think, was like... Um, like twenty five hundred dollars of improvements, and then there was maybe like it was five thousand or seventy five hundred, and then uh, over ten thousand or or over fifteen thousand, somewhere somewhere in those ranges. Um, 
and the city would contribute uh, a, a certain percentage of money based on you know any of those three tiers to entice people to make changes you know uh and so we've it was it was very well subscribed uh the first time uh council member gran and our staff and i think councilwoman md you know they were literally going door to door to you know talk to the businesses about it um you know one of the situations i think we've talked about here many times is that we have a lot of property owners uh on artesia that are not necessarily local right they own that property um they're not necessarily making investments into those properties they're they're leasing them out uh and you know in some cases i i don't know what they're doing you know when they lease it out but uh you know a lot of those buildings or areas could use tenant improvements and i don't know you know a lot of times we don't see it happen we just see a business change hands and uh and so we were trying to um uh start you know if you will in a very minor way what would be the ultimate uh, revitalization uh of of artesia and aviation clearly this is a much more broader um thing that uh, a lot of people want to see and that's going to include an enormous investment in city infrastructure as it relates to how does artesia and aviation boulevard function uh for both transportation uh you know uh, cars bikes uh pedestrians you know uh so we you know back when we started that program we also started um so that was the storefront uh improvement program we also uh created the artesia aviation corridor area plan to be folded into the general plan process um because that area really in my opinion required a specific plan you know it's an area that had been overlooked for years uh and you know we tend to see a lot of the focus on the harbor uh area um or at least you know there's always discussion and money is being needed there because the harbor area which we manage uh uh for the state lands commission uh it, it is in need dire need of you know um facelift and there's a ton of failing infrastructure down there um so it tends to suck up a lot of the energy but you know one of my concerns uh and my colleagues in north redondo was that artesian aviation was getting overlooked just as a byproduct of that kind of taking up all the energy uh, and so uh, the ACAP has, you know, that that process went through as part of the general plan, the storefront improvement plan has been happening. And now the storefront improvement plan has been, you know, in one of our votes last year, it was expanded to outside the Artesia aviation area. I think, you know, we got as many subscribers to it on Artesia and aviation as possible. I, I recall the Waterfront and Economic Development Department stating that. Um, and now uh, uh, we have agreed to do something similar for the international boardwalk area. So I'm not sure if Nils was saying, you know, we shouldn't do it up there anymore because I, I think it has run its course. Uh, I'm not sure anyone is subscribing to it, uh, but it's hard for me to fully comment on. on I'll, I'll I'll try to find the video and uh, and watch it so I could maybe you know respond to you uh, privately. Uh, or, you know, we could talk about it next month, uh, but I don't know specifically what he said and what he was talking about. Uh, does that help? Thank you. Yeah, sure. thank you. Um, okay. Uh, so let's see, any other questions? Comments? Uh, Mark, okay. Yes, okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, so uh, this past week, the council uh, approved the King Harbor Amenities Plan. Uh, it's a conceptual plan that uh, I think, as we've talked about here in recent meetings and also with our Waterfront and Econ Economic Development Director uh, this spring, uh, you know, really considers what are the changes that need to happen in the harbor area um it will be kind of a piecemeal process because the city doesn't necessarily have the funds uh set aside to do these things but it will include uh things that are required like the boat ramp um uh changes to the sports fishing pier changes to seaside lagoon to moonstone park 
international boardwalk, um, you know, creating, trying to create better connectivity. Um, some of all of this requires uh, uh, addressing sea level rise issues. Um, so, you know, we, the city, that, that I, I can't can't really say we anymore because I think after approving this plan, everything that happens from here on out uh, is really going to be under the domain of the next city council uh, post March. Um, but uh this is this is where we're at and now the city will have to continue to find um resources to be able to pay for all of this um when it comes to something like a boat ramp uh you know i think we will be able to get state funding for that uh through the department of uh, boating and waterways um seaside lagoon has gotten some state money uh given to it i don't know if we will be able to get the full amount that would be necessary to do, you know, what uh, is being recommended. Uh, and then each of these areas, you know, or nodes, if you will, throughout the uh, the harbor that are in the plan will also, you know, uh, I use the word piecemeal, but they will, you know, individually go through um, a process, you know, uh, that will be open, public and transparent for people to weigh in on. And, um, so you know i would anticipate that over the coming years uh individuals residents you know and stakeholders in the community will have an opportunity to comment on what they want to do or what they don't want to do um and i know mark that you will be a part of that process uh in some way shape or form so uh so we will uh, stay tuned and if there are any updates between now and March, I, you know, will make sure to bring them back. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Uh, yeah, uh, great, great uh, summary there. Thank you very much, Christian. Great job. Um, the um, <clears throat> just a couple things I might highlight to the group here. Um, one is that one of the things that came out of months of this process was to recommend a brand new marine educational facility over at the old Joe's Crab Shack location. As many of you probably know by now, um, uh, the city council of oh gosh, two, three years ago, uh, voted to spend $750,000 for the right to buy Joe's out um, on 60 day notice. Uh, to potentially put some of these amenities in, and we've determined that the marine educational facility would be the best fit. Uh, Joe's on their own just suddenly vacated <laughs> the other day, so all of a sudden that opportunity is uh, uh, here maybe sooner rather than later, and the Harbor Commission um, has made recommendations to do something sooner uh, rather than later and potentially uh, move our own local uh, waterfront education program uh, in there. So that's all very ex ex exciting. Um, I, something for all of you to give some thought to the future of the lagoon. OK, um, this is going to come up fairly soon because, as Christian says, we already got some money toward towards it. I have found those conversations very interesting. There's a a group of folks in the city who say we need more lap lanes for practice for practice um there's some other folks that have suggested some wave pools uh in that area um one of the things that's come up in the discussions is is under the cold marine layer really the right place uh for a lap pool and of course it's not coastal uh related at, at all and folks have pointed out that uh the aviation park area could be maybe a better place for a, a pool I know the pickleball uh, folks were looking at that locate location also Beach City's health district in their phase two plans for a, a really nice aquatics uh, center I've I've become more and more amenable to the idea of these wave pools two types have been suggested to me one is for toddlers just something that kind of knocks them on their butt and maybe prepares them for their parents to take them to the real beach next year and the other is a small standing uh, uh surf pool for surf training doesn't take a lot a lot of uh room and of course we don't have dependable surf so this would be great 365 days a year way to train people to surf and transition them uh to use of the real beach i like both of these ideas because they're at least coastal related they transition people so all of you on the call think about that because that's coming up soon it's an interesting discussion uh final thing i touch on is um dry boat storage is kind of a an unresolved one we still have some uh, work to do just like we didn't have a boat ramp for 60 years we haven't had dry boat storage for 
uh, 60 uh, uh, years. Staff has been quite resistant, but they never much like recreational things. They like things that make money. Um, uh, but uh, Harbor Commission has made a couple recommendations to City Council. One is to specifically reserve some space, both to the north and the south, for some uh, boat storage. And second, they're going to form a subcommittee to work on those uh, locations. So very exciting times ahead for any of you who'd like to might go boating. We're going to have a real live boat ramp. And hopefully, uh, with help of Harbor Commission, we'll have some uh, dry storage areas where uh, any of you who might like to keep a boat the harbor could do so fairly inexpensively. So yeah, lots of exci exciting stuff. Uh, help help us um, move forward with all this. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. All right. Any other comments, questions? Uh, Lee. Uh, yeah, thanks, Christian. Uh, since uh, Mark mentioned Harbor things, I just thought I'd let everybody know. Um, we have a boat parade coming up on December 10th. Put it on your calendars. That's right. All right. So December 10th, that's going to be a Saturday, I assume, right? Lee? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I will say this, folks, if you have never gone down, if you have lived in this town and you have never gone down to see the holiday boat parade, you absolutely should. It's uh, it really is one of those special things that uh, that Redondo has. Uh, and uh, you can watch it from anywhere along the uh you know the channel uh sometimes and lee maybe you or mark can weigh in on this uh, do we know if bleachers will be set up at moonstone park this year um yeah i can chime in on that a little bit because during your budget process um we got that two thousand dollars um re-established for uh doing the uh, bleachers so i would absolutely assume that the boat parade chairman will take advantage of that funding all right, great. Well, thank you for reminding me because I had already forgotten that. Um, so uh, good. Yeah, I would recommend anybody go down and see it. It usually starts somewhere around like 430 in the afternoon. Uh, there's like a paddleboard uh, uh, contest first. And then uh, and then once uh, the sun has gone down, uh, the boats will uh, get themselves lined up and the gun will go off and you'll see them all turn their lights on at the same time. Uh, it's uh it, it is definitely something that everybody should participate in at least once all right final questions thoughts comments all right then with that said folks we will uh call it a wrap for october uh i will do a, a community meeting in november but i will just announce now i think i'm gonna actually skip the december one because i'm gonna Go visit my family for the first time in three years uh, since COVID happened. So, uh, so with that said, we will uh, we'll see you next month. Um, and then, uh, just a reminder again: um, November eighth is regular election day here in the country. Uh, the week after that is when uh, is when people can start pulling papers for the March election. Uh, District three, my seat. Uh, District 5, Councilwoman MDC, and then City Treasurer and City Clerk. Those are the ones that are going to be on the ballot. Uh, so anyone who is interested, by all means, contact the City Clerk and you can uh, you can do what I do. All right, folks, have a great rest of the uh, weekend and we'll see you soon. Take care. All right. Thanks, Christian. Bye, Lee.